Hi there. This is part of a series of reports that I've been making about the big cover story that came out in The Hollywood Reporter last week on House of the Dragon, the first Game of Thrones prequel series to be fully produced and released. But that's not all they talked about. The entire first half of this long cover story was on the road to getting the first prequel, this six-year-long process of going through rival candidates, rival pitches, and the missteps they made along the way, chief among which is that House of the Dragon is not the first pick that they went to film. With much fanfare in mid-2018, the first one that they chose to be the prequel and focused all their attention on was Jane Goldman's Long Night prequel, that they ordered it to film a pilot episode, they filmed that in summer 2019, and when the rough cut was shown to HBO by the fall, it was apparently so god-awful that they, the phrase in the article is they locked it away in the HBO dungeon on the shelf next to the unaired Game of Thrones pilot, which was infamously bad. And they managed to keep a real tight lid on this thing that We've only heard bits and pieces of what was wrong with it, and my news channel here was, I was one of the few who was actually really following along with everything, all the rumors, so I think I know as much as anyone in the fandom can say of what the heck were they doing. I'll tell you, even I have only heard rumors, and maybe not even all the rumors, that it can always get worse. That... All the book fan sites immediately said this is the worst idea in general principle for a prequel, that Martin never wanted to set a prequel during The Long Night, that he's written no source material on it because it's the distant past. And on top of that, it's primeval forest. There's nothing in Westeros. There's maybe eight sentences. And in this article, George R. R. Martin himself directly reiterates all these points. There's no source material, that it's just forest. There's no locations you know of that he really didn't want to set something there. Even so, what we thought would be the problems, that there's no source material, it's generic, it might even be stereotypical, that pales in comparison to what actually happened. That, near as I can tell from the different rumors, this goes above and beyond all that. This, this is... it. The phrase I'll use at the start of this is you get the sense that Jane Goldman's Long Night prequel was going to do for Westeros medieval fantasy shows what Julie Taymor's Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark musical was doing for superhero movies. <laughs> that it was this bizarre, like, experimental theater, experimental art house film thing, lyrical, very different, and it, it seemed like it was out of touch with reality. That if you asked a generic Game of Thrones TV-only fan, what did you think a Long Night prequel would be like? What she made wasn't like that at all. We go, oh, there's going to be Starks, they're going to be fighting White Walkers, they'll be doing... It was very strange. And I've only heard half of the rumors, and we might not, we might never know the full extent of this, but weird things that they said it was marred by creative differences from the start. She had bizarre ideas for it. And this new article in The Hollywood Reporter gives us a handful of tantalizing new clues as to what was actually going on. Beyond the significance of Martin reiterating, not only was he reiterating the criticisms, he admits in this, I told HBO my criticisms. I was going to HBO complaining to them, this is a terrible idea. I do not support it. It isn't based on anything I wrote, and it's not just, oh, it's my writing. It's, there's, there's no story there. There's no setting. It's forest. Well, two things to start with. What the showrunner said and what one of the executives said, that they were talking about how the first two ideas that Martin brought to them were Duncan Egg or Dance of the Dragons, and they felt Duncan Egg, the focus was too small to sustain a major series. That how do you follow up on a big large-scale war with Duncan Egg going to a tournament, and I agree with that. There, there is a, well, it's it's so different in scale and scope, people would go, it's not Game of Thrones enough. And I, I can see that. Dance of the Dragons, they were hesitant to do at first, because they said it's a little too similar to Game of Thrones. It's a civil war over the Iron Throne. And eventually they came around to going, okay, that's what people want. It's the War of the Five Kings with Dragons. 
they explain that before the slide I'm showing now, in oblique terms, because you can tell they don't like talking about it, and they were not present for this, the new showrunners, Kondal and Sapochnik, they, they give the quotes saying that just how weird and experimental this thing was in the broadest of terms, that HBO's thing after Martin, the creator of this world, said, these are my top two ideas. They said, Dance of the Dragons is kind of too similar. Let's subvert expectations. <laughs> Let me read off the exact quote here. Sapochnik, at first HBO was like, how can we subvert thrones? Like, I didn't make that up. He actually used the word subvert thrones. That in the articles, it, and Sapochnik says, quote, The Dance of the Dragons felt like an obvious straight-down-the-line prequel. So I think they were less hot on it because it was like, well, who wants to see more Game of Thrones? Then the irony, of course, is lots of people. It's that whole corporate thing of, all right, we're going to make a sequel of this, but we're going to make it entirely different to subvert expectations of it. Then, then why are you making it? As opposed to, there is an argument for it needs to grow and ha have variation and stuff, but continuing, Ryan Condal himself agrees with Sapochnik and said, quote, at the time, this is the old HBO, by the way, these executives aren't in charge anymore. This is the old Plepler administration. Condal says, quote, the desire at HBO at the time was to not just offer up a sequel spinoff that's about the war for the throne. They wanted to do something so totally different that it would blow everybody's minds. I think that's why they went with The Long Night instead. And then later on, Condal was brought in to redo The Dance of the Dragons, this time with time skips. I talk about that in a different video. So it's not just me pontificating. If, oh, it was like the Julie Taymor turn off the dark. of This is the showrunner of Dance of the Dragons in broad terms saying it wasn't just that's a little bit of a retread. Can we do like Targaryen Conquest, which is about the forging of the Iron Throne, or it's something different within Westeros, but still a Game of Thrones-style show? They were very intentionally, self-consciously, actively trying to subvert expectations. They used the word subvert, and make something so off-the-wall different and experimental that it would blow everyone's minds to push the boundaries, as it were. So they weren't trying to make a relatively grounded what, from watching Game of Thrones, you would think was the story of the Long Night, fitting in that visual universe and the style of it. This was some sort of almost experimental film-style thing. And because HBO has this hands-off policy, it's bizarre. They'll micromanage that kind of choice. But they had, at the time, the old HBO had this thing of uh, the auteur creator that what attracts top-tier class A talent to our channel, all the top showrunners and top writers, is that we give them total creative freedom. That's one of the reasons Plepler never reigned in when Benioff and Weiss were going off the rails. So it seems like they had no oversight over Jane Goldman and like only bothered to check in on her after she had already filmed this mess. And it's, you know, the foisted by your own petard thing of, this is what happens when you exert no supervision. That is a terrible plan. What if you hired a crazy person? And I can't completely blame Jane Goldman because, like, I, I, I haven't seen her whole thing, so I can't fully judge it. Maybe some of these things weren't her ideas, but ideas forced on her by HBO through a combination of factors. So yeah, part of this, I don't want to vilify Jane Goldman without, no, she's never talked about it. So we'll have to, o over the course of years, it, it'll come out what really happened. But first off, just this is, the first big thing is them saying this was actively trying to be as different as possible to the point of shocking people, and they got what they asked for. Second thing, and this is, these are the only two new quotes apart from just Martin outright saying, I told them not to do this. It, we knew that was implied before. This is the, only, the second, only other thing that's really new information. Is Francesca Orsi is the new head of HBO drama, but she came on after Game of Thrones ended. She wasn't there at the time. She was a lower level person. I don't think she worked on it directly, but she, she's talking about what happened. According to Orsi, Blood Moon, uh, the working title we, we found out was Blood Moon was the name of the show, The Long Night Prequel. 
And yeah, they actually refer to it as that in this article openly, though the linguist Peterson had already confirmed that. We knew it from set photos that was called Blood Moon, and it was a working title subject to change, and it's spelled as one word, but okay, Blood Moon, Long Night, same thing. Orsi says Blood Moon won the Bake Off, the five-way competition. Oh, it won based on merit. No, the other showrunner said it won because they, you thought it was the most bizarre experimental idea subverting expectations possible. That's not what merit means in terms of being well-written. You picked it because it's this weird mix of the familiar soundbite stereotype, I want something cliched with Starks and Lannisters and White Walkers, and yet at the same time bizarrely experimental to the point it wasn't Game of Thrones. So it had the worst of both worlds. It had rehash of other stuff, plus bizarre twists on everything. Another thing is, again, that this wasn't meant to be a cohesive story uh, uh, for all of Westeros, the Age of Heroes. There's different heroes in each of the Seven Kingdoms. The Lannisters are not part of the Long Night story, and they kind of shoehorned the Lannister origin story into that. And you could almost see a fanfic version of kind of making that work, again, if they had done what we anticipated as people who, even TV-only people, just taking it seriously, trying to make, like, a flashback to what was The Long Night actually like. Then they did all this experimental, subverting expectations stuff. And the only clue we have to that is, and again, this is reading through her double talk, Blood Moon really stood out as different. They keep highlighting how different it was, how experimental. It stood out as different with unique world building. If, if someone's describing your project as different and unique, that's a backhanded... You can tell they're, they're trying to deflect from something. But here it is. She says, Well, tonally it was very adult, sophisticated, and intelligent, and... There was a thematic conversation at the center of it about disenfranchisement in the face of colonialism. That's point one. And religious extremism. That's point two. This is all of the new information, and now I'm just going to quickly go over... I made maybe eight hours worth of reports about the filming on the Long Night Pilot as it was happening across two years. So, you know, I already had a news channel. So, eventually what I did was I made a summary video titled Everything We Ever Knew About the Long Night Prequel Pilot, which condensed eight hours worth of reports across two years into a single two-hour thing. But the entire second hour is just going over casting information, so it's more like a one-hour video. I'm linking it below. It contains, it's the summary of everything we ever heard about anything, and I'm one of the few people who was really investigating this critically without just assuming it would be good. Check that out, but I'm giving you the short version now. Short version of all of the hints we, we ever learned about it is, filming-wise, things we figured out just from filming observationally. We knew that the Starks and Casterly Rock were in it, that the Casterlys used to control Casterly Rock until Lan the Clever, the founder of House Lannister, swindled it away from them somehow, and there's different explanations of how he did that, that there's rival stories about Lan the Clever. So, okay, Long Night, the Starks are in it, the Children of the Forest are also in it, we knew because we saw cave sets, and also probably Casterly Rock, which also has caves and cliffs really three broad things. I'm, I'm cutting out all the other little things, that, like, oh, there's this armor in this shot, and all the spy photos. Short version, Starks, Casterly Lannisters, Children of the Forest, point two. Based on casting sheets, it was not a world-spanning story with Yi Ti in it, which is their version of China and the Roinar. Like, so many people at the time were just assuming they'd make the Long Night they would make, based on the World of Ice and Fire, which talks about how the Long Night affected every part of the world, how it affected Yi-Ti. They weren't doing that. Because in two years of following this, they never cast a single Asian person. They never even put out casting calls for Asian actors. So why would you assume that their version of China is in it? No, the only non-white people they ever put out casting sheets for were described as black. That there's Caucasian, there's black, I mean, they're men, women, young, old. The only ones they ever asked for were black. So, who are they playing? 
What I found out from a leak which I made at the time from people working on other prequels, and I have no way of confirming this even to myself, it was told to me verbally, but I believed it because someone who is in a position to be able to show me mate unrelated materials, I was told that they stumbled into this based on the best soundbite. White Walkers, Starks, Lannisters, and only after picking it they realized, wait a minute, one of what we were saying the whole time, that uh, Westeros is a primeval forest with just the First Men, their version of the Celts, there's no familiar locations, there's no story, one other aspect of that is like there's no racial diversity in it, which people will complain about. And like, you know, a Targaryen conquest show, you can work in Dorne or something, is, you know, okay, they're a different ethnic group. Their solution to how, you know, primeval Celtic ancient past wouldn't have other races in it, right? Their solution was apparently, oh, we'll cast only black people to play the children of the forest. The indigenous elf guys. Now, I don't mean to mock James Cameron's avatar, because he actually took that seriously, and it's more of an homage, he said, to earlier tropes, but in space, that yes, it's these indigenous aliens, many of them played by actors of color, but it's like, it, the jokes are obvious of, oh, you're gonna do what Avatar did, and have the only black people, or at least most of them, in this show, or that oh, we'll cast nothing but black actors to play the elf guys who are the indigenous inhabitants who live in the forest, who are tribal, who are primitives, and no, 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 they're, they're in touch with nature, and all oh, that other stuff, and, and with the trees, they commune with the trees, with the, yeah, it's Avatar, but, and the white settlers, the humans, the first men, are encroaching on their land. Obvious question is, Game of Thrones already established that the children of the forest aren't human, that they're covered in so much prosthetics you can't see what they look like, that Leaf, the lead child of the forest who talks to Bran in season six, she was played by a Japanese actress. That it didn't matter, because she was under full prosthetics. But I thought, oh, okay, well, you know, like Avatar, like other stuff, at least you're trying to work in the black actors, and they're coded as indigenous people, even though, okay, well, they're under prosthetics. That almost, you could see a sane person stumbling into as a mistake, that it's, you know, it's really tropey. What blew my goddamn mind was the second half of the leak I heard, that, well, they, they're not human, and how does that count as representation? If that is your goal. And... The rumor was, that someone told me verbally, is there's going to be a magical curse that turns all of the, the... Originally, the children of the forest were black humans, and a magical curse will eventually turn them into elf creatures. Which, I don't know if that might even be a thing in the books. Maybe the children of the forest used to be more like humans, but you're doing it with black people cursed black... Explain why do black people look different from the white ones? Well, they must have been cursed. Was so It really tone deaf and just, you never said this aloud to another person, did you? And if you think weird things can't happen, look at season 8 of how, com I mean, how compartmentalized it was that people filming their own little section didn't know what the whole looked like, that the actors making season eight, most of them, like the extras and stuff, the hundreds of people, they didn't know what the finished product looked like. They didn't know what the other storylines were like. Even, like, the people filming the Children of the Forest stuff, I don't know if they really understood the, the full extent of how this was happening. That yet, when you're a small piece, you know, small cog in the machine, you don't get the full picture of it. HBO apparently didn't either until they saw the rough cut of the whole thing. So really look at the groups that are in this show. I mean, the, the only groups are the First Men and the Children of the Forest, and everyone just assumed, oh, there's a lot of black people, look how diverse it is. And the naivety of that, of just because, I, I feel bad saying this, I actually saw people going, wow, there's a female writer in charge, she'll make sure there's racial diversity. How, how does that equate? I'm not, you need both in the writer's room, but so many people were going, look at all the black people they're casting, and where I was going, who are they playing? Because I heard this weird rumor. But the more they cast, the more weird it got. Skipping ahead here to July of 2020, two big reports came out. 
one from Redanian Intelligence, one from David Lightbringer's channel, actually. I'll get to him in a minute, but uh, Redanian Intelligence, the big casting site, um, fan site that gives a lot of good casting news for the Witcher franchise, but they were covering this too. July 2020, they posted this report on not all of the Children of the Forest in it, but three actors they identified as playing Children of the Forest, including Leaf, the one that Bran interacts with thousands of years later, and all three of them were black children. Literally children, all of them were black. And while that doesn't, you know, fully confirm, well, there must have been dozens of actors cast as, like, a Children of the Forest village or something in this, the only things we ever found out black actors were playing in this were Children of the Forest. The lead child of the forest that, that would be the linker to the next show, Leaf, was a black child. So while that doesn't 100% confirm this, yeah, casting things eventually came out that lined up with that rumor I heard. So that's what we heard. That So going back to what Orsi said of, oh, no, at the core of it was this sophisticated, intelligent, thought-provoking, pushing the boundaries, thematic conversation at the center of it about disenfranchisement in the face of colonialism. You goddamn ripped off James Cameron's avatar. Poorly. And while it's Cameron's avatar, I think you know, it's a metaphor, and then you added what Cameron didn't do, you added in a magical curse to retcon the obvious plot holes, in, but they're not black people, they're, they're elves. That's what we heard anyway, and which casting rumors seems a lot, casting info later lined up with. What I can generally say, I'm going to go through this, is we think that episode one was a casterly was marrying a Stark princess as some sort of marriage alliance. That seems pretty clear. Martin himself, in the new article, mentions that it was a southern noblewoman was marrying someone from the north. And we got that from other reports. We saw from just filming spy photos, this looks like Casterly Rock, these look like ancient Stark banners. Two other big things. There was... Uh, David Lightbringer's leak, which was also July 2020, but before that, a couple months before that, November 2019, right after the cancellation, the Game of Thrones linguist David J. Peterson gave an interview on a podcast where he said, yeah, I was working on it, that I had already worked out the Children of the Forest language, so I was doing stuff for it. And he said he himself hadn't seen a description of the whole thing. They just said, he confirmed there's a wedding scene in it, because they told him, make wedding song lyrics in a different language. He said the two languages he developed for it were the Children of the Forest language, which that's, in and of itself doesn't really prove anything. We know the Children of the Forest would be in a long night show, and he'd already made it for season six, they just cut it for time. He said, I only ever worked on two languages, not a Yee-T language, not a Roinar language. He said, Children of the Forest and the Andals. So these are the two big things, what they did to the Children of the Forest, and then that they shoehorned in the story of the Andal invasions, which in the books happens thousands of years later. It's an entirely separate historical epoch. That the whole reason the Long Night is shrouded in myth is it predated writing, written records. The Andals brought written records, the, the, the practice of keeping written... Uh, things like that to Westeros, and that's why history snaps into focus, starting with the Andal invasions, which were 2,000 years after the Long Night. Uh, this is the quote that Peterson gave. He said, quote, Blood Moon was set before the Andal invasion. The first men and the children of the forest are getting on well together, and then the Andals come over, and that's the beginning of the series. So yeah, it looks like they were mashing... To, not This is an entirely separate problem. They were mashing together the Lannister origin with the Starks, which, okay, well, it's the age of heroes. You kind of think they'll do that, even though they're not really related in the books. And on with a marriage alliance between the Casterlies and Starks. Why? They're different proto-kingdoms. They're, they're petty kingdoms in entirely different parts of the continent. Then, let's mash in the Andals in there just for the sake of getting that in, when you're just playing fast and loose with everything. Now, last we have David Lightbringer's leak, which, uh, this has four big points. 
First was he said the immediate cause of the long night was a meteor strike that kicks up so much dust, it you know dims the sky, makes it, the moon shines red through all the dust clouds, hence the name Blood Moon. It's dark. Leads to a long winter. And that's just the immediate cause, though, and that doesn't really prove anything. Like, my mental image of how the long night came was that, like, ice hurricanes coming down from the far north spreading winter. But in this case, it was someone magically called down a meteor shower instead of, like, an ice storm. One or the other it doesn't really make much difference. That's just incidental to me. That doesn't really prove anything one way or the other, and that's, that's fine. Second, what we had already heard and seen from spy photos and from Peterson, that there was a big wedding scene in it, because Peterson said I made wedding lyrics. The leak that uh, Lightbringer's source heard was that the wedding was, as I said, between a Stark princess and someone called the Last Casterly. And the Stark princess is like, like Bran Stark, she's a latent greenseer like Bran in Season 1. But, okay, a Stark and the Long Night being a Green Seer, you kind of expect that. That's not bad in of itself. But it was this Stark princess marrying the last Casterly, I guess, in the male line. Because their version of Lan the Clever would be the last Casterly's cousin. Like, maternal cousin, okay. And what we think Naomi Watts was playing was, like, Lan's mother, but I could be wrong that she looked like she was a casterly, she was wearing all gold because they're, they're rich, and that there was like a love triangle between Lan the Clever, the last casterly, his cousin, and this Stark princess, and I haven't seen enough of that to even judge, oh, love triangle, well, there's a lot of love triangles in a lot of things, so whatever, but the big thing was you're shoehorning the casterly Lannister story into the Stark story with this big wedding thing, and you're shoehorning in the Andals are coming for some reason, and if this was a casterly Stark wedding, why did Peterson make lyrics for the wedding songs in the Andal language? I mean, he said that. And my guess, and this is a pure guess, is that maybe the last Casterly's maternal cousin, Lan, maybe his mother is an Andal or something, of why would there be Andal lyrics at this, that maybe this is already, they've sped up the Andal, and the Andal invasions weren't like a, a conscious invasion in one generation. It lasted many hundreds of years, and sometimes it was just people marrying in. Much like the, the English invasions of Ireland back in the Plantagenet era, where it was, it was more adventurers and war bands came in spurts, and sometimes they intermarried, settled in. That isn't even the worst idea, but it's still, you're trying to shoehorn in the Andals. And the fourth and last thing was that the Stark and Casterly retinues at the wedding were accompanied by green men priests. The green men are these mysterious priests that people think have a connection to the children of the forest who live on the Isle of Faces in the middle of the God's Eye Lake. And this might be something the books will later show, because there's foreshadowing that that's going to be a factor later. This was saying that, like, the green men are... There were long wars between the First Men and the Children of the Forest as the First Men migrated in and took their lands and cut down their forests. And it says that the real way the war ended was a faction of the Children realized they would never win. They realized they were going to lose. And these were the Green Men. So they switched sides to ally with the First Men. But in the process, over hundreds of years of living with them, taught them their religion and became like a priestly caste or something. I'm not sure. But that's how they were working that in. And then, like, a rogue green man would side back with the children of the forest out in, in the wilderness who still hate the first men and cause the long night to attack them, or something. And, again, Martin has stressed he had such little involvement in it, there is no way of knowing if that is even remotely booked. So many other things were so wacky in this, like, merging the Andal invasions with the long night, and... Well, let's make it a parable of a hard-hitting parable about colonialism with the black-coated indigenous people suffering. It's just, we don't need this crap. This is heavy-handed nonsense. I don't like using the word woke nonsense, but who would be satisfied with this? Audiences that hate woke diversity stuff wouldn't like it, and 
every black person I have shared these leaks with in my videos for the past two years that, well, this is generally the idea, has been horrified by this, that this is utterly patronizing and tone deaf. And not to mention the curse thing of who was supposed to like this? I don't know. It, it, it's, it, it can unite the world in how much it offends everyone. So I don't know, but that we actually, the two things we got out of this were really the showrunners on House of the Dragon describing it, and in the article is confirming what we had suspected from leaks, that this was intentionally experimental and subverting expectations. They use the word subverting that they weren't just trying to faithfully tell the story of the Long Night, that they said, we reject the Dance of the Dragons, we reject Duncan Egg, we want to, quote, do something so totally different that it would blow everybody's minds. And then they got what they asked for, just not in the right way, that it was so mind-blowingly weird. This was the Julie Taymor turn-off-the-dark of TV shows that... It's almost like self-parody when you see a TV parody of someone made a wacky bad play or bad TV show. But this is reality. This is real life. How does this happen? I don't know. And all of these rumors of that, and that's the first thing, it was intentionally trying to be as experimental and different as possible. And they stuffed in all the stereotypes. Let's put in stereotypical big names like Starks, Lannisters, Cash in a White Walker hype. And for so long, it was the Naomi Watts prequel. And people didn't even ask what it was about. They just said, well, it's the Naomi Watts show. That that's what HBO was doing with Game of Thrones, that it stopped being about the story, but what celebrities can we put in the lead roles? Instead of let's have like unknowns who can do the story writer, talented actors who are still well-known professionals. It was trying to cash in on name recognition. It's just, if I were to sit down and hypothetically come up with a parody of what I thought HBO, the old HBO, thankfully everyone doesn't work there anymore, of what they could do as a really bad prequel, well, there'd be celebrity stunt casting, and they'd be trying to subvert expectations as much as possible, and it would be racially insensitive and, and patronizing, what, so that neither people who wanted to talk about race or didn't would be happy, because everyone was offended, because it was tone deaf, and black people would be revolting against it, purely from a point of practicality, you understand, not even touching on morality, it's, did it occur to you that people might not like that? That that might be seen as offensive? <laughs> that there would be a backlash purely from the standpoint of ratings? People wouldn't like this. I don't know how they did that. And on top of that, oh, well, we'll just mash together the Lannisters with the Starks, we'll mash together the Andal invasions, and just that basically two sentences we have. Of after all the double talk of, well, it was good, but not great, but it was good, and it was intelligent, and it was different and unique. It was, at the center, was a thematic conversation about the disenfranchisement of indigenous people in the face of colonialism. Y yeah, <laughs> the black people as children of the forest. And then when Redanian came out and actually showed, and here's three black children who were cast as the lead children of the forest. Now, grant, keep in mind, remember, I came out and said, like, the week after the cancellation was announced, like, this is, like, November 2019, I came out and said, all right, I've, to I've been hinting to everyone what's wrong with it, but now that it's canceled and it can't affect anything, I was told that they did this with black people and children of the forest. That was November 2019. The following June, the July of the next summer 2019, these casting reports came out that lined up with what I said. And then David Lightbringer's thing as well, and his source also said, we heard that they were played by black humans. That he showed me the thing behind the scenes, so... Wow. Martin himself was always trying to distance himself from this, say, I did not come up with this shit at all. This article even says Martin was yelling at HBO, what are you doing? I don't know if they even told him all of it. What, what is striking, though, this article says that HBO never showed Martin the Long Night prequel pilot. That they said they were going to show it to him at the time. He said they're planning on showing it to me, there's a rough cut, and then it didn't happen. That It says here we made it a point not to show it to him, and a lot of these people don't work there anymore, with good reason. That's just weird. And the dumbest thing is this final quote here about what happened was 
the pilot came out, everyone was hyped to hear, oh, the pilot, the rough cut's going to come out, we're going to hear good things about it soon, and you could tell through the reports that people were suddenly like, maybe we shouldn't be doing Long Night, and it's like, what, was the pilot not good? And I was telling everyone for a long time it wouldn't be. They said, this is like October, early September, and then October they um, came out again, they said they gave them a month to rework it and re-edit it with some suggestions. And how do you fix something like this in a re-edit when it's a core, its core parts of the show are insane? This isn't something that can be fixed in editing like the exposition's a little clunky. It says here, final thing I'll leave you with, is that Goldman, for Goldman, sources say that HBO's cancellation came as a total shock, even though she'd been handed back the rough cut and told, make the, this set of re-edits and fixes that she was confident of a full series order to the point that she had assembled a writer's room to break the first season, to break it down. We, we saw her hiring up other writers. We saw that through IMDb, that they were hiring writers for season one at the same time that she was in the middle of making changes to the pilot based on notes they had sent back with it. And even with a direct warning, we have problems with this that you need to fix, she was utterly confident that she'd get a full season order to the point that it came as a shock to her when she was canceled. Now, I don't know about that, but if you think about it. If Goldman knew that these ideas were absurd or bad, core ideas, not just little mistakes, if she knew how bad they were, she wouldn't have done them. I, again, I'm using the Julie Taymor Spider-Man turn off the dark analogy that this isn't an accident. She wanted to do it this way because she thought it was amazing. She thought this was this really great commentary on colonialism. We'll cast black people as children of the forest as black humans. And then they're always that. And compared to what Condal said of, you know, maybe we shouldn't just keep casting black people as the suffering natives that are colonialized or as at best pirates, that it was that trope all over again, literally. Well, then how do we explain the plot hole that they're not humans, they're elves? Eh, magical curse. So this, this new info just starts lining up with that, the little quotes we get of, it was about colonialism, and second half of that, it was about religious extremism. What, you were putting in the Andals so you could, what, show that the faith of the Seven is evil because it's their stand-in for Christianity, and Christianity is bad? That religious people are bad? No, Martin's books, even though Martin is himself, he said he's a lapsed Catholic, he's generally atheist now, he said he respects people with religious beliefs. Like, Septon Meribald is one of the most important thematic characters in the books. That he is, It's the leadership, the bureaucracy of the faith has become corrupt, but the priests on the ground who are religious and believe in what they're doing and nuns and stuff are generally moral people who have faith in times of darkness. And when he varies, and now there are other people have done that too, and other spectrums of, of medieval stuff. Well, the leadership might be bad, but the local level guys are, are still moral. He doesn't mock that. He doesn't. The, the books are not criticizing religion because of that. they're criticizing institutions. That he said, "I will never have the 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 seven gods of the faith of the seven directly appear because that would invalidate the religious beliefs of the characters in it. It would mock it." to show that these people have faith in a religion that may or may not exist. The way that Lord of the Rings, God literally exists, the Valar exists. In this, as he says, like real life, there's religion, some people believe in it strongly, it is a legitimate thing that they believe in it, and they follow that moral code. It's not to be mocked. It's to be mocked when, like, you know, septons who've taken vows of chastity are secretly going to brothels and having sex with whores. And he mocks their hypocrisy, but that's they have not living up to their own code. But you see, the books don't mock organized religion like that. What? The, in, historically, the Andal invasion is when the last of the children of the forest got wiped out because they distrusted the magic of the old gods when the Andals came. So you were, you were not only having this racist trash, you were then have which would have, no one would have liked on either end of the spectrum, you were then ham-fistedly forcing in the Andals just to bring in the Faith of the Seven for the sake of showing religion is bad and a colonializing force and religious extremists are, ah, they're bad. Mocking people of faith. Did, who, who was this made for? 
And while it was trying to be as bizarre and different as possible, they got what they asked for, they got what they deserved. They wasted $35 million on this. They put all their eggs in one basket because it's the only prequel they pitched, it was the only prequel they hyped up, even as Martin was saying, they kept referring to it as the prequel, even though Martin was saying, you know, we haven't quite given up on the other two ideas that are still in contention, which turned out to be Dance of the Dragons, which became House of the Dragon, and they put the Valyria thing on hold, but as late as, like, when they were putting together the rough cut for the Long Night thing, at the end of August 2019, he said, there's still Dance of the Dragon, there's two other ideas, and then right after the cancellation, Peterson, in his interview, he confirmed the other two pretty well-developed ideas that were in contention as late as this August were Dance of the Dragons and Old Valyria. And these are big, expansive pre One turned into the House of the Dragon thing as soon as Long Night was cancelled. They immediately said, hey, we're doing Dance of the Dragons instead. But for two years, for over a year, they were acting like this was the only prequel. And how much time was wasted on this? That Going back all the way to 2016, when Martin said, well, my top two picks as the author of this world are Dance of the Dragons or Duncan Egg. And it took them three years. They wasted three years when they could have just li listened to Martin in the first place. <laughs> of course, that's the old HBO, which died and then got bought out by AT&T. And the new people from HBO Max, different set of executives entirely. It's probably why we're getting the normal story of the Dance of the Dragons now, with time skips as Martin wanted. But when you think of the mistakes of this, that this shouldn't just fade into history. When you make a blunder on this scale... I hope the truth comes out eventually. Much as if people say, we want to see what the first Game of Thrones pilot was like, I hope the story of this eventually comes out from, like, actors who were in it if their NDAs run out. And it's not like, oh, I have a need to blame everyone. It's just stupidity like this shouldn't doesn't deserve to be swept under the rug. The amount of money, the amount of time they wasted that nearly destroyed this as an ongoing franchise. And this isn't a Benioff and Weiss thing. They were long gone. <laughs> It's just that that the human stupidity thing, you know, the corporate mentality of it's a little too similar. Can we subvert expectations? That when you think subvert expectations, this is a, a through line from that. This is the same time they were subverting expectations with season eight, and you know, Jon Snow killing the Night King is predictable. At the same time that you were watching that, they were filming the Long Night prequel, which was meant to subvert expectations. Is this why we don't have nice things? Or didn't have nice things? But this was just a three-year-long misstep, a wrong turn that the franchise... Thankfully, the article concludes that the result of all these failures is now people are listening to Martin at the new HBO, the new people. That the swiftness of HBO's getting on board with Martin hand-picking Ryan Condal was the beginning of a pivot in the author's relationship with the network that Martin sometimes felt out of the loop in the later seasons of Game of Thrones. Really. And when in the early hunt for successor shows. But after the season 8 backlash combined with the failure that same year of the Long Night pilot is god-awful, that double blow, think of that, within months of each other, season 8's a disaster, and look, here's the rough cut of our insane Long Night prequel pilot. Uh, due to all of that backlash and people leaving the network, it says here, all agree that Martin's influence has risen within the company. The HBO thought, hey, maybe we ought to listen more to that guy who created all of this. Then just last year, HBO signed a massive five-year development deal in the eight-figure range with Martin. So the good news that came out of all this sacrifice from season eight from the absurd heard Long Night prequel is the people in charge at HBO now aren't treating Martin as this advisor that they can ignore, but wow, he's the idea guy who is, we should listen to, that when you see him at Comic-Con panels, when you see him in the behind-the-scenes videos, Martin himself is being treated as the creator-producer he deserves to be treated as. This was his story. This is his creation. He's the one who's making this, not the outsider writers you brought in to, hey, let's rewrite Aegon I to be a drunken lout. That actually was a pitch. I talked about it in the other video. That's why we don't have Targaryen Conquest. 
or let's rewrite the long night like this. Martin is this amazing fantasy author. They're actually coming around to, wow, we treated him like trash for years, and look at where that got us. It got us the Season 8 backlash. It got us the Long Night pilot. So, from what this article says about rumblings behind the scenes, things have really changed for Martin's standing within HBO because of so many other dumpster fires. They f the people now in charge finally agree Martin should be in charge of his own stuff. We should listen to his suggestions.